These mysteries will make you question everything. So remember, this is for entertainment purposes only. Let's check them out. Throughout its many years of existence, the world has left us with some intriguing events and strange phenomena. Some of these mysteries can be somewhat eerie or just downright strange. Number 5. The Travis Walton incident refers to a strange event that occurred in 1975. Travis had been a forestry worker in Turkey Springs. He and six other members of a tree thinning crew had returned to the Magian Rim on the 5th of November 1975 where they would encounter one of the most famous UFO cases in history. Travis would later go on to relay this entire ordeal in a book titled The Walton Experience. The tree thinners were working on a contract for the USDA Forest Service and it had begun as any other ordinary workday. The book describes the incident, saying the crew had consisted of 22-year-old Travis Walton, 21-year-old Alan Dolly, John Goulet, who was 21, Ken Peterson at the age of 26, 21-year-old Dwayne Smith, the youngest member who was 17-year-old Steve Pierce, and the oldest being the boss of the crew Mike Rogers who was 28. At the time, it had been a clear day with good weather expected. They had continued on working until dark and would later head back up the logging road and make their way to Forest Road 300. Suddenly, there had been a brilliant light emerging from the trees 100 feet away. The book goes on to detail the crew members' reactions and describes a golden disc said to be hovering 90 feet above the ground. Travis explained that he had jumped out of the truck and approached the interesting looking saucer because he wanted to get a better look. As it so happened, the alleged beings inside the saucer were just as interested in seeing him. It's Why we didn't just stay in the truck? Why, why hop out and go be curious? Nothing ever comes, nothing ever good happens of us going to be curious, bro. And if you often notice, it's it doesn't happen to anyone in the vehicle. If you stay, you ever heard of a case where somebody's sitting in their vehicle and was beamed up or abducted or something like that? No, it's either you was walking in the woods or you went to, to investigate the light that you saw or something like that. You're on foot. So what I'm starting to pick up and figure out is stay in your vehicle. Maybe that could possibly save you from whatever's about to happen. Detailed that the saucer was in fact a UFO and inside of it sat some alien visitors. The spacecraft allegedly began to wobble and make alarming mechanical noises that were sent throughout Travis's body. Suddenly, the forestry worker was knocked into the air by what he describes as a blue or green bolt that struck from the bottom of the curious machine. He had written that at that moment, he could not see, hear, or feel anything. It had been revealed that the rest of the crew became so frightened that they drove off, leaving their coworker behind. As so stated, one of them had seen the UFO strike off in a northeasterly direction at an incredible speed. Once the fear subsided, they turned the truck around to go back to Travis. By the time they'd gotten back there, it was dark. The crew searched the site using their flashlights but found no tracks and no signs of a struggle, and so they returned to Heber. Another crew member reportedly called into the Navajo County Sheriff's Office and told them that one crew member had gone missing. When deputies arrived, the crew had reluctantly relayed the story. The sheriff and the undersheriff had driven with three of the crew members back to the site. They tried to search the area, but it was far too dark. Travis's family was later notified that he had gone missing. For the four days that followed, truckers, law enforcement, the Forest Service, helicopters, and people on horseback searched the entire area, but to no avail. Dang. High radiation levels were said to have been found within the area where the alleged abduction had taken place. Soon, the six crew members were under suspicion of homicide. They then volunteered to take polygraph tests, according to Travis's retelling. The polygraphs all came back fine. A whole five days after his disappearance, on the 10th of November, Travis awoke near a highway, half a mile west of Heber. When he came to, he says he saw a light turn off above him. The light was said to have come from a curved, glistening hull. According to him, the vehicle quickly sped off. Travis had gotten to his feet and sped off toward Heber, entered a phone booth, and got a hold of Allison Neff, his sister. 
It was just after midnight when his brother-in-law and his brother had come to pick him up. Travis appeared dehydrated and hungry and allegedly lost around 10 pounds, but didn't appear to be physically injured. Dana, Travis's wife, remembers the night so vividly. His brother then drove him all the way to Phoenix to get him away from all the media. Should have drove him straight to the hospital. That's what I was hoping they'd say. Like, you need to figure out, is he okay? If they could have, like, implanted something in him, if it's visible, something, check his, his vitals, make sure everything is normal, as normal can be, I guess, in this situation. And others who had gathered around the town. His family had also received some phone calls stating that Travis should not be taken away in case he conveniently disappeared. Instead of seeking immediate medical attention for the abductee, they contacted Ground Saucer Watch. Later, he would go on to be checked out professionally and undergo a session with a psychiatrist. He would be placed under regressive hypnosis, during which he would detail creepy imagery of two alien creatures who didn't communicate with him but did appear to be rather interested. He detailed the interior of the craft as well during this time. Travis would then go on to have a polygraph test done and voice stress tests, all of which indicated he was being truthful and was within a stable mental frame. After the release of his first book, another book was released titled Fire in the Sky, where he would go into even more detail in an attempt to counter the lies and rumors that were being spread. After the incident, the abductee had led a fairly normal life, and his case remains to this day one of the most well-documented alien abduction stories on record. Even 40 years after the incident took place, it's still gaining a lot of interest. A report from 2015 explained that Travis had spoken to individuals who made the journey to the site of his abduction. In a statement, he shared that he didn't know how much time had gone by since he was taken, but had later discovered it had been five days and six hours. He recounted another disturbing fact where he was forced down on a table but soon lost consciousness. The next thing he remembered was awakening on the highway. One of the other attendees of the discussion had been Rogers, the driver of the truck that evening, who had circled the truck around to go and look for Travis. Along with them was John Goulet. This was the first time all three of them had been together since the ordeal. The men were asked a variety of questions whose answers had seemed to corroborate Travis's claims. One question that was asked was how long it took for the men to get back to normal. According to Travis, some of them never did and it had taken a really long time. I wouldn't be, would you? I, I, there's no way I could go back to being normal. There's no way I'm going back in the woods. It's, it's no possible way. Every time I step out of the house, I probably look up, make sure I don't see nothing. Driving around town, I'd be looking up, making sure I don't see nothing. I get out my vehicle, I look up, I make sure I don't see. Like I would constantly be looking up, and it's just certain places I would never go again. Period. You got to re remember, they witnessed this. Then they went and told people. Then they came back with a search party. Then people started looking at them like they must possibly did something. So they had to take a polygraph. Then he shows up out of nowhere. Ah, oh, nah, my nerves would be terrible. It was an ongoing process that they would have to try to accept at some point. Number four. One of the strangest events in history was the disappearance of the famous mystery writer Agatha Christie, who herself became quite a mystery. She had been born to the name Agatha Mary Clarissa Miller in 1890. Her father had been American and her mother was British. She reminds me of like one of my school teachers, bro. She has that face and that look. She was the youngest of three siblings. It's supported that Agatha lived a happy childhood where she would write, play piano, and sing. Upon her father's passing, the family fell into financial problems. Her mother had hoped that Agatha would marry a social class individual when she was older. It was on a Friday, just after 9.30 in the evening, the 3rd of December in 1926, when the crime novelist left her armchair, kissed her seven-year-old daughter, and then descended her Berkshire home staircase. She drove off in her Morris Cowley, thus sparking one of the largest manhunts in history. This was the first time that airplanes would be used in a search for a missing person. Hundreds of locals aided in the search as well. William Joynson Hicks, the home secretary, 
urged for a faster progression in locating the missing writer. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who created Sherlock Holmes and Dorothy L. Sayers, the Lord Peter Whimsey series author. Two famous crime writers became absorbed in the case. With the use of their specialist knowledge, it was thought that they would be a big help in the case. Shortly after her disappearance, Agatha's vehicle was located. It had been abandoned on a slope at Newlands Corner, close to Guildford, and appeared to have accident damage. Agatha Christie, though, was nowhere to be seen. As the case pressed on, speculations began to mount, and theories of all sorts were proposed. One such theory was that she had fallen into a nearby spring, but this was ruled unlikely. Others believed that this was nothing more than just a publicity stunt to promote her sixth book that had just been released. Other rumors suggested that she was a victim of a homicide carried out by her husband, a former World War pilot, Archie Christie, who was said to have had a mistress. Archie and Agatha initially had a happy marriage, as depicted in one of her books, called The Mysterious Affairs at Stiles. Doyle had attempted to use paranormal means to solve the mystery. He'd used one of Agatha's gloves, which he brought to a medium. This brought about no clues as to the missing writer's whereabouts. Sayers had returned to the scene where Agatha had disappeared in search of new clues, but this too turned up futile. The disappearance of the writer had even made the front page of the New York Times newspaper. Exactly 11 days later, on the 14th of December, Agatha Christie was found. She was alive and well and had been staying at a hotel in Harrogate. But the circumstances surrounding this strange 11-day mystery brought up more questions than it did answers. Sound like one of those theories of, or or, or conspiracies, of, conspiracies about her doing this for publicity for her book. Don't that sound like we find you at a hotel? You know everybody's looking for you. You've been gone this amount of time. You have a family. Come on now. What would make you do this? Unless you got in an accident, hit your head, and you don't know who you are. But that don't seem like the case right now. It seems like they. I don't know. That's weird. Agatha was also unable to answer these questions as she had no idea what happened to her. It had been left to the detectives investigating the case to try to piece the ordeal together. Memory gone. They had later concluded that Agatha left Berkshire, traveled to London, and crashed her car. She would then check into Swan Hydro, now called Old Swan Hotel. She carried no luggage with her and used the alias Teresa Neal. This had been the name of her husband's lover. When joining in at the Palm Court dances, she'd been seen by one of the banjo players, Bob Tappet, who recognized her almost immediately and quickly contacted the authorities. The police had also tipped off Archie, who would roll up to the hotel and get his wife. I think they need to go look for the husband's lover. As if she's checking in under her name, then where is she at? Agatha, though, was in no hurry to go anywhere and left Archie waiting in the lounge while she changed into her evening dress. Upon the arrival of Archie and the police, they had taken a seat in the corner of the hotel dining room, where Archie would go on to watch his wife walk in and take her seat at another table. She sat there reading a newspaper with the front cover detailing her disappearance. Oh, Archie would later approach her, but witnesses note that there was a general sense of confusion, and it appeared that Agatha had no idea who her husband of 12 years was. Upon making their way home, many had gathered in the London train station in an attempt to catch a glimpse of the two. After this strange day, the writer never spoke of the incident or what occurred on those 11 days that she had gone missing, and it's been left up to speculation as to what occurred between the 3rd and 14th of December in 19... What, 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 what would make a person use their husband's lover's name then if you don't know who you are? How did you pull this name out of the thin air? Was it because that name probably was on your mind at the time of the incident? Could that be a case? Anybody ever dealt with something like this before? This is throwing me for a loop. Whoa. 1926. Archie expressed that his wife had suffered memory loss from the car crash. Yeah. But Andrew Norman, a biographer, believes otherwise. He suggested the possibility of psychogenic amnesia caused by trauma or depression, which is said to be a rare condition. But this is merely a theory. When she healed and was able to pick up her writing pen once more, she discovered she was no longer prepared to tolerate her husband's affairs. In 1928, the divorce was finalized. Many theories were sparked following the disappearance. 
Some spoke of a nervous breakdown following the passing of her mother and the embarrassment she faced with her husband's affair, while others suggested it was merely a publicity stunt. Archie later went on to marry Nancy Neal, and Agatha married an archaeologist, Sir Max Mallowan. No one involved in the story ever mentioned the 11-day disappearance again, further adding to the mystery. Agatha would then go on to write more novels, with her last being The Postern of Fate in 1973. She was in her 80s at this point. Her writing quality had begun to decline in her old age, and it was even postulated to have been caused by dementia. She had also written a novel called Elephants Can Remember, which was centered around a novelist who was experiencing memory loss. The book was slammed for its errors and weak plot. It's thought that perhaps this book was a hint at her cognitive demise. The book was released in 1972 when she was 82 years old, and she passed away in 1976 and was buried alongside her husband. He messed her up, bro. He messed her up. I don't even see how he slept at night. He should have been nervous and worried that she wasn't going to show up for him. But he really ruined her, man. That's sad. The more I think about it, the sadder it gets. That's sad. Number 3 Dr. John E. Mack was many different things to various people. To some, he was a fraud or a cheat, while to others he was a support system, listener, and a protector. Dr. Mack was a psychiatrist who studied at Harvard. Additionally, he'd been the founder of the Cambridge Hospital Department of Psychiatry. He was widely respected in his field. Initially, he spent years working on child development issues and identity formations and won the Pulitzer Prize in 1977 for the psychoanalytic biography of Lawrence of Arabia that was titled A Prince of Our Disorder. When it came to the 1980s, the well-respected psychiatrist put his whole career and reputation at risk when he began to investigate alien abduction phenomena. Dr. Mack started his strange journey by innocently holding sessions with patients who believed that they'd experienced an alien abduction. He would go on to use hypnotic regression methods and would later dig deep for some more evidence for a book he wrote titled Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens, which was published in 1994. Next, it was Passport to the Cosmos, Human Transformation and the Alien Encounters in 1999. Mack would discuss that he would not guarantee that aliens were abducting or talking to people, but he did support the fact that there's a really strange phenomenon that he could not account for in any other manner. He explained that he couldn't know what it is, but it certainly invites a deeper inquiry. Abduction, human encounter with aliens, was made up of around 100 self-proclaimed abductees' testimonies. Wow. They'd each contacted Mack at his Cambridge hospital office. The interest in alien abduction had started late in the psychiatrist's career. He stated in an interview that he'd heard of the phenomenon in 1990 and initially thought that it was some sort of mental illness, but he soon realized that it was his job to help these abductees deal with their trauma and feelings. So he got a hundred and something people to contact him or to reach out or whatever, or he may have come across throughout his time. That was back in the 90s, right? Imagine how many are there are now. But how many do we hear from? We don't hear from none. None. Why is that? I would like to hear from more accounts of people who've experienced some form of encounter with aliens. Bro, I want to hear the stories. And we can kind of start to weed out the ones we think are fake and the ones we think are real and then try to like build upon that and see what we're dealing with. Mack expressed that his position on such cases would be of skepticism. Additionally, he'd considered the phenomenon to be a real mystery that would require and merit further investigation. Mack was never able to solve the mysterious phenomenon of alleged alien abductions, but did suggest that such events had been occurring in the context of a planetary ecological crisis that had been reaching critical proportions. Furthermore, the information that's being provided about this situation was conveyed by the alien creatures to the abductees, or the experiencers as they're so referred to. Some of his co-workers had expressed that extraterrestrial visitors and their impacts on humans were perhaps not a productive area of research. 
A 14-month-long inquiry was launched by Harvard into the methods of Mack after the publication of his book. His work would be viewed as a slur on serious research by some co-workers. Among various stories and claims that he investigated, there had been only one really strange one which stated that the abductee had claimed to give birth to a half-human, half-alien child. During his various discussions with these patients, he'd concluded that most of them had not suffered from any obvious psychiatric disorder, aside from the effect of some sort of traumatic experience. The patients were expressing powerful emotions that were actual, real experiences. Often, as stated by Mac, these experiences were associated with UFO sightings that had been reported by family, friends, media reporters, the community, and journalists. These cases would also be somewhat supported by markings left on the victims. They were physical traces, such as lesions or ulcers, which would usually heal rapidly and would also not follow a psychodynamically identifiable pattern, such as one we might see with religious stigmata. Mack had stated that he was being met with a phenomenon that he felt could not be psychiatrically explained, but had also not been within the area of the Western scientific world. At the age of 74, the brilliant psychiatrist had his life taken when crossing a street in London in 2004. This sparked the theory. Just, just that, that just didn't sit right with me. Look what he's investigating. Look what he's doing. Look what he's showing interest in, researching. And he might have been getting too close. So I ain't going to say that it wasn't an accident with his whole situation, but that just don't feel right. Sit right with me. That they'd been assassinated after getting too close to the truth about extraterrestrial life forms. No evidence was unearthed to support this conspiracy theory. In 1990, Mack would go on to meet Bub Hopkins, described as the father of the UFO abduction movement. He would go on to show Mack all the proof he had so far gathered. This included photographs of scars and scoop marks, as well as a collection of symbols that had been seen on these alleged alien spaceships. The psychiatrist would later go on to meet some of the others who had spoken of abduction, and would come away convinced of this. He claimed that they were all healthy-minded people who had experienced some unusual events. According to Mac, as far as he could tell, the individuals had not heard these stories from elsewhere, and they all seemed to be rather real. Mac had become fascinated by these stories and entities and stated that they act as spirit beings upon his observation. He continues this by saying that they penetrate the physical world and so they're not exactly like spiritual beings the way one might expect them to be. That spring, the psychiatrist would go on to see some abductees, even though some of his friends would ask him to stay in the closet with this particular interest. He would then go on to deliver papers at UFO conferences and was later elected to the board of the Mutual UFO Network. Dr. Mack would also become the consultant on a movie called Intruders. He would also go on to set up an organization called the Program for Extraordinary Experience Research. He would help the abductee patients recover some memories using hypnotic screamathons. This would be combined with breath work, which Mack said would undo memory repression that had been imposed by the extraterrestrials who had allegedly abducted them. He explained that once the trauma had been brought to the conscious mind, the power of the aliens would dissipate. Mac had seen some of the most intense terror, rage, and grief that he had ever encountered during his time as a psychiatrist. What was much harder to overcome, as Mac explains, was what's known as ontological shock, which is the realization that what you thought happened actually did happen and was experienced thus defining and changing their reality as they knew it forever. The doctor detailed that these patients would come to him with some vivid dreams and denial. Mac would have his patients undo this denial by having the abductee stare into the eyes of the alien in a figurative sense, which would ultimately undo this denial and force the individual to face the reality of what they had experienced. Mac discovered that with the end of denial, a new relation would appear to the creatures. It was reciprocal or loving, as he would explain. Mac believed that the more open to communication aliens were, the more information would be available to us, such as ecological and global dangers. Some people had grown concerned about the psychiatrist's methods and theories of false memories were brought into question. Mark had even separated from his wife of 34 years due to this abduction obsession. This being said, if a well-respected, well-known, and educated psychiatrist risked his marriage 
his career, and his life to investigate into the world of alien abductions, then perhaps there's more to the mystery of extraterrestrials than we may know. I said the same thing about those pilots. The same thing. See the similarities? And people questioning the same thing. If a person's willing to do all that, go through all this scrutiny, risk their lives for all of this information and research and exposing, it's got to be some truth. It's got to be some truth to it, man. It may not be all that we're looking for, but it's got to be some layer of truth. Well, not many things were revealed as to what exactly Mac had discovered during his research. It was profound enough to change his entire career path and put him at risk, which is certainly strange and rather eerie. What is it that we've yet to discover about extraterrestrial life? Good question. Number two. Who would have thought that one of the most well-known and well-studied historical wars would produce so many mysteries? World War II appears to have many unexplained events tied to it. Some of these have left historians stumped for years. The mysterious events include the Battle of Los Angeles, the strange passing of Rudolf Hess, and the disappearance of Flight 19. The Battle of Los Angeles occurred in the weeks that followed the Pearl Harbor attack. Americans believed that there were imminent enemy roads in the U.S. Unsupported reports came in on the 9th of December, 1941, stating that there had been an approaching aircraft. This caused a slight invasion panic in New York City, which would go on to send stock prices plummeting. It was also documented that inexperienced pilots had been mistaking fishing vessels and whales for warships and submarines. Mm. Tensions had been high, which only worsened after the U.S. Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, had warned the citizens to prepare to accept what he referred to as occasional blows that would come from the enemy. Not long after, on the 23rd of February in 1942, a Japanese marine ship had surfaced at Santa Barbara, or they would proceed to release artillery shells at an oil field. This had only caused some minor damage and absolutely no injuries or casualties, but this would go on to cause heightened paranoia and some weary trigger fingers. This would also cause an unusual home front incident. On the night of the 24th of February in 1942, naval intelligence told the citizens on the coast of California that they needed to prepare themselves for a potential attack. Everything was calm for a few hours until just after two the following morning. Military radars picked up what had appeared to be enemy contact west of Los Angeles. The air raid sirens began and a blackout ensued. In only a few minutes, troops had handled some weapons to defend the area and swept the sky with searchlights. Weaponry fire began after 3 a.m. and unidentified objects were allegedly seen in the skies. It had been absolute chaos for several minutes to an hour. The all clear was given later that same morning. Something truly bizarre would go on to be discovered in the daylight. It appeared to the American military that there seemed to be no evidence of an enemy attack whatsoever. There'd so been what was that we shooting at? What are we shooting at then? And still, don't this seem similar to what we're dealing with today? It's interesting that things... Like I say, history repeats itself. Let's just say that. Been no enemy planes hit down, or a single atomic weapon dropped from the skies by the enemy. The only damage that was sustained had come from the U.S. Army itself when they opened fire. Within this time, people had, however, been involved in car accidents due to the sudden blackout, and some sustained heart attacks. This would later become known as the Battle of Los Angeles, and the entire ordeal had no explanation. The next mystery was that of the mysterious passing of Rudolf Hess. Hess was imprisoned for alleged war crimes. He was sent to a prison in Spandau, but a former British army doctor named Hugh Thomas, who examined Hess, concluded that the incarcerated man could not possibly be him. He would bring about some circumstantial evidence. One piece of evidence had been that Hess sustained a wound to the chest during the First World War, but this prisoner did not have any scars. On the 17th of August, 1987, the prisoner, whoever he was, had passed away. During the time of his mysterious passing that occurred in the prison garden, a nurse recounted that there had been army personnel present. 
It was rumored that his life had been taken to stop him from releasing some secrets of war, or that he was not actually Rudolf Hess. While many questions surrounding his mysterious passing were left unanswered, one theory was supposedly disproved with the use of a DNA sample. The prisoner of Spandau was in fact Hess, as confirmed by the DNA testing. The exact circumstances of his passing remain unclear and unanswered to this day, despite what medical records may indicate. Yeah, but how did they test the DNA? Do they get bone? Do they do, do blood? I'm sorry, man. I watch, I watch a lot of shows and different movies and stuff like that, and that can easily be fixed to have the results that you want as well. Anybody else felt like that too? Like, that means nothing to me. Nothing to me. Like, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. That don't mean anything to me, man. They, they have a way of doing things to get the results that they want you to have. So if they, that could have still not been the dude, but they made him appear to be fixed it so it does come out that it was him. So you stop worrying or, or checking in or trying to figure this whole situation out. The next strange mystery was the suspicious disappearance of Flight 19. This is said to still be one of the most perplexing aviation mysteries. There are some who have already blamed the disappearance on the Bermuda Triangle, but there's far more to this strange event than getting sucked into the sea. The mystery began on the 5th of December in 1945, when a routine training flight was in progress, which was around 10 minutes past 2 in the afternoon. Five TBM Avenger torpedoes had taken off from a naval air station in Florida. The aircrafts were known collectively as Flight 19. A three-hour exercise was scheduled and was called Navigation Problem Number 1. Initially, the flight proceeded in the same smooth manner that it had on the previous day. But after the flight turned north for the second part of the journey, something odd had happened for reasons that are still uncertain. The leader of the flight had been Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, and he had suddenly become convinced that his compass had been malfunctioning and that they were heading in the wrong direction. The situation escalated when a front had blown in, bringing rain and wind and cloud over. The whole flight had become disoriented. One pilot could be heard saying that he didn't know where they were, and another said that they may have taken a wrong turn. Uh -huh. Another pilot instructor on a separate flight, Lieutenant Robert F. Cox, had overheard the radio communications. He quickly informed the air station and contacted the Avengers. Taylor explained that both of his compasses were out and that he was trying to find Fort Lauderdale. He sounded anxious and stated that he was over broken land, which he believed was the Keys. Taylor's claim did not make sense. He was over hens and chicken shoals of the Bahamas less than one hour prior, but now believed that he had drifted a hundred miles away from there to the Florida Keys. Pilots were trained that if they became lost in the Atlantic, that they should point their planes towards the setting sun and fly west. But Taylor was convinced that he'd been over the Gulf of Mexico and was hoping to find the peninsula. He then decided to take Flight 19 in a northeasterly direction. Some pilots had noticed that he was making a grave mistake and believed right. that if they had flown left, they would have made it home. What's the use of you having the training and if you ain't going to use it? Resort back to it. You know what I mean? Do what you have been trying to do. Find the sun, go west. Taylor was persuaded and the flight took to the west direction but had again changed course around 6 p.m. Soon, they began to run out of fuel and had to prepare his pilots for a crash landing. I would imagine you can't be indecisive up there. Once you pick a plot and you, you start heading that way, you need to probably stick to it. You start changing, you can be retracing your steps again and going right back to where you was lost at again. So the search for Flight 19 began. A pair of Mariner flying boats had taken off and after only 20 minutes, they appeared to follow suit of Flight 19 and disappeared from the radar. The Mariner was never found and is believed to have exploded after takeoff. This theory would later be confirmed. The following day, over 300 boats and planes set off in search of Flight 19. Five days later, in a search of 300,000 square miles brought up nothing. There were no bodies and no debris. These are only some of the strangest mysteries of the war that are yet to be solved, with only mere theories attempting to explain them away. Number 1 In 216 BC, 
a battle between Roman armies and Carthaginian forces ensued, and later became known as the Battle of Cannae. The aspects of the battle between the multi-ethnic and largest Roman army remain obscure and a topic of controversy. In part, this may have been caused by the loss of Carthaginian records of what had taken place during this battle, along with distortions and contradictions in the Roman accounts on the matter. It's believed that the Roman accounts may be subject to disinformation. One area of controversy is the matter of the strength of the two armies. The Romans were defeated at the Ticinus River in 218 BC, at the Trebia River battle, and at the Lake Trasimene in 217 BC, and so they decided to create the largest army to rid Hannibal, the Carthaginian general and statesman. In records, we find that the Romans recruited eight legions, which was matched by another eight legions of Italian allies, bringing the total to 16 legions. Each legion had a strength of 5,000 and so the army force totaled at 80,000. Hannibal's army, however, was made up of a grand total of 40,000 foot soldiers, half of that of the Romans. Not only did the Romans outnumber Hannibal's infantry, but had also outnumbered his cavalry. Hannibal had a cavalry of 10,000, with the Romans being almost 13,000. That being said, the mystery is how exactly was Hannibal able to defeat the Roman army? would vastly outnumbered him and were superior in strength. Another topic of controversy regarding the Battle of Cannae was who was in command of the Roman army. After the defeat of the Romans at Lake Trasimene and the passing of the commanding officer, Fabius Maximus was appointed. He soon found that he'd been no match for Hannibal. He decided to follow the Carthaginian army at a distance and harassed them but had refused to face Hannibal and his army in battle. This would go on to earn him the derogatory name of Delayer. But the Roman pride could not take such embarrassment, and Fabius was replaced with two new consuls that had been given the assignment of defeating Hannibal for good. The report names the two consuls as aristocratic Lucius Amulus Paulus and Gaius Terentius Varro, who was the son of a butcher. Varro has been blamed for one of the worst disasters in Roman military history. The question is, though, was Varro the one in command, and did Paulus advise against the battle with Hannibal, as the accounts in Polybius and Livy so claim? It stated that the two had altered command daily, and that Paulus could not commit himself to a battle on the 1st of August. The following day, Varro ordered the army to deploy, but this does not make a whole lot of sense, since the mission of the army was to face and defeat Hannibal, which means that both the consul's interest would have been to engage and destroy the Carthaginians. It's theorized that perhaps Paulus refused to engage because the battlefield was in favor of Hannibal and his army tactics. During the battle, Hannibal used a pincer movement that surrounded the Roman forces and almost entirely annihilated them and took the lives of over 70,000 Roman soldiers. With when you got numbers, you can do that. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's an easy game plan and strategy. Only a few thousand being captured or escaping. Since the Romans were unable to move around in the tight space that Hannibal's tactics lured them into, they were vulnerable. The accounts of the battle, however, were in the process of sorting through what facts were fabulous or moralizing. The ghosts that are being referenced refer to the Roman survivors who had crossed the sea and had sown the Carthaginian fields with salt and erased them from the map, which is said to have been an act of genocide. The mystery of the whole ordeal comes in with the legend that randomly came up afterwards. This was the legend of Hannibal's ghost. Historians suggest that the Romans were so embarrassed by this defeat that they rumored a strange story. The legend stated that every 216 years, the ghost of Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, would come back to haunt the battlefield. According to the strange legend, Hannibal was cursed to roam the battlefield until Saturn completed a full orbit. This story was based on the Roman belief in the influence of the seven planets on human affairs. It was believed that Saturn took 29 and a half years to make a full orbit. The number 216 came about multiplying the orbit length by the number of planets, which had included both the moon and the sun. It's believed that on the anniversary of the Battle of Cannae, on the 2nd of August, the ghost of Hannibal can be seen floating about the battlefield, along with his army of ghosts. It was also said that if anyone sees his ghost, they're doomed to be sucked into the afterworld soon after they've witnessed him. Thank you guys so much for watching. Sheesh. Listen, man. 
sometimes you listen to these stories and you be like, man, thank God I wasn't around back in those times, bro. Certain things they dealt with, even back to the lady, man, and her getting in the wreck and her husband's cheating. And I ain't gonna lie, that sounds like a story of today, but the whole thing, how it played out, yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds like some Jerry Springer type stuff, don't it? Sheesh, man, but this was five creepiest historical mysteries ever that'll creep you out, man. And I can't lie, they came through on this one. This is pretty interesting, though. Love history. Y'all get at me in the comment section, man. Let me know what you thought of this and stick around and stay tuned. Until next one, I'm gone.